We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'm glad for the opportunity to discuss the emerging impact of co comparative genomics on understanding evolutionary processes, including extinction. This new capacity to understand the evolution of life through the evolution of genomes can be used to better assess threats to biodiversity and even help restore biodiversity. This knowledge, along with the ability to save living cells from which animals and plants can be produced, offers a new role for human intervention and a novel development in life on the planet. As we've heard, we are experiencing an accelerated extinction rate, largely due to human causes. Extinction is an endpoint. There are many species that are declining and we're losing biodiversity even without having an extinction event. It's estimated that one third of vertebrate species are in decline and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature that assembled the red list uh, for the species that they have uh, analyzed, 28% are recognized as threatened or endangered. So we are in uh, a very challenging time for biodiversity. But knowledge of extinction can be gathered from fossil evidence, from studying um, extant species genomes and back through time, and also of uh, ancient uh, uh, extinct species uh, with DNA methods. I wanna focus for a moment on the Wrangell Island mammoth. This is the last population, surviving population of mammoths. And because of preservation of uh, specimens, uh, good genome assemblies have been produced from Wrangell Island um, mammoths. And um, uh, this has allowed a an evaluation of their genetic status as they were declining uh, in comparison to um, other mammoth populations and the closest living relative of mammoths, which is the Asian elephant. In the center figure there, um, in the blue column on the right, are the, is the genome, uh, uh, is the Wrangell Island mammoth, and the colors coming from the bottom up to the darker purple at the top represent the severity of uh, deleterious impact of mutations across the uh, genomes that are represented there. And the Wrangell Island mammoth has, has more mutations in the deleterious categories than the um, other mammoths, the Siberian mammoths, and it's been suggested that the Wrangell Island mammoth was in a mutational meltdown. By comparison of Wrangell Island mammoth mutations, with similar locations in the human genome, this word cloud has been produced to show what the impacts of these mutations might be, which are uh, indeed quite severe. It's possible to use genome information to infer uh, historical aspects of population size, especially the effective population size. This is the number of individuals that actually contribute genetically across generations. And the Hawaiian monk seal is a critically endangered U.S. species. There's a, um, this is a information from a, um, a preprint um, and depicting this population size through time. 
and the scale goes from hundreds of thousands of years ago back to a thousand years ago. And you can see that the uh, Wrangell Island popu mammoth population declined rapidly, uh, but it was 50,000 years ago. And in the last 30,000 years or so, the Wrangell Island population of mammoths has stayed small. For them to have survived, they must have purged some of their genetically deleterious mutations. And we, by studying genomes of other species, we're gathering more information about this. Two species I'll mention are the vaquita, the most endangered cetacean in the world, a critically um, uh, endangered population. In the, it's only found in the northern Gulf of California, and there may be only a dozen individuals that survive. In the lower left figure, you can see the genetic variation across the vaquita genome. The horizontal red line represents the level of genetic diversity in the human genome. And across the uh, blue, uh, shades of blue chromosome scaffolds of the vaquita genome assembly, you can see that there's much lower genetic variation. But that variation is not um, in large blocks of uniformity. Um, so it's, it's consistent with there not being a high degree of recent inbreeding, even though the population is small. So the vaquita may have purged a lot of its genetic variation. Mountain gorillas are another example. There's two population of, of mountain gorillas. Together they comprise something approximately 1,200 individuals. And in comparison to their much more numerous western lowland gorillas, these are the gorillas you see in zoos, uh, Western lowland gorillas have more severe deleterious mutations. They have a much larger population size and they have more mutational differences, but they also have a larger proportion of severe deleterious mutations as estimated by mutations that are believed to cause loss of function of a gene. On the other hand, the mountain gorillas have um, proportionately higher um, number of um, missense mutations, mutations which alter the um, amino acid sequence of a protein, but may not be um, uh, highly deleterious. And in small populations, mildly deleterious mutations can accumulate. And that's because this is, there's a deterministic process involved. It's been called the extinction vortex. In a small population, it's more likely that individuals will reproduce with other individuals uh, to whom they're closely related. And in small populations, um, there won't be a lot of offspring, and there will uh, uh, be less likelihood to transmit the entire gene pool from generation to generation. So that these combined effects of inbreeding and genetic drift cause a loss of genetic variation, which um, causes a, a reduction in individual fitness, less um, resilience to disease, less fecundity, lower reproduction rate, these factors combine to produce a smaller population, and we're in a positive feedback loop. So what can we learn about um, extinction from a more comprehensive survey of uh, mammalian genome assemblies? And this is work that's been underway. At the end of 2020, um, uh, the Zoonomia Consortium published the uh, alignment of over 240 mammalian genomes many of which were uh, uh, provided by samples from the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. And this, this analysis is being continued uh, now um, to specifically with a, um, uh, in a study that emphasizes the uh, application of, of comparative genomics to um, evaluation of extinction risk um, as uh, categorizing species with respect to their uh, threatened status as uh, produced by the uh, red list of IUCN. This is work of uh, Aaron Wilder at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and Megan Supple in Beth Shapiro's lab at UC Santa Cruz. And using the genomic data uh, uh, from Zoonomia uh, and the alignments, they're able to um, uh, find some correlates with uh, extinction risk across this much larger number of species. And they find that overall, the genome-wide heterozygosity, uh, lower, lower genome-wide heterozygosity is associated with increased uh, risk of uh, being in threatened status. Heterozygosity refers to variation in the genome. And although this study involves only one analysis of only one genome per species, every individual inherits a, 
a, half, a chromosome from its male parent and a chromosome from its female parent. So they won't be the same. And so the, uh, it's possible to uh, analyze the differences and use that uh, metric to estimate or to uh, uh, estimate the uh, overall heter uh, heterozygosity of a population. And in this case, it's strongly correlated uh, uh, negatively with extinction status. That is, the lower the genetic variability, the more likely a species is to be threatened. Using uh, these data to make the demographic inferences, as I showed with the Hawaiian monk seal trajectory, um, they looked at um, uh, all of the species in their analysis, and the warmer colors represent species in the threatened uh, categories. Uh, overall, all of the mammals that were looked at, there's a very significant correlation with this effective population size, actually the harmonic mean of the effective population size. And uh, it's because it'd be very noisy to show them all at once, they're broken down in here, here into um, taxonomic groups of mammals and in the larger figure are carnivores. And it's pretty easy to see that the endanger, the threatened category species are, have then had longer periods of time with low population numbers. So historical effective population size impacts contemporary conservation status. Um, threatened species have smaller historical effective population size. Threatened species have larger effective population size to census population size ratios. Um, if a population is very large and declines rapidly, it's the harmonic mean of its effective population size will decrease more slowly than the census population size. And so the ratio will be greatly increased. And for species that we have data like this, um, they, qual they fall into very high risk of uh, endangered status. Overall, uh, uh, Aaron and uh, Megan looked at all of the metrics they could derive from uh, the genomic analysis with regard to the uh, uh, risk, extinction risk uh, uh, classifications. Over the species in the threatened categories, uh, there was a statistically significant association um, that these species had more deleterious mutations in coding regions, lower estimated genome-wide heterozygosity, and smaller effective population sizes. They also noted that increasing the number of annotated genome assemblies would increase the power of these analyses, and we can look forward to seeing more work in this area being done. We've been interested in these kinds of risk assessments with regard to the uh, genetic rescue of northern white rhinoceros, the most critically endangered form of rhinoceros. Uh, there's only two living individuals, both females, but the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance Frozen Zoo has cell cultures from 12 individuals. We've sequenced their genomes and compared them to a similar number of southern white rhinos. And we find that the cell cultures of a dozen northern white rhinos have more genetic variation than the standing population of 15,000 southern white rhinos. And we can see the effects of uh, the history of the demographic uh, trajectory of southern white rhinos in the genomes of, of today's southern white rhinos. The uh, southern white rhino went through a genetic bottleneck a century ago, down to 30 or 50 individuals. And so that's why they have lower genetic diversity now. And they also have larger uh, segments of their DNA that's genetically homogeneous. We call these runs of homozygosity that are derived, that occur because um, in the, uh, through the bottleneck, uh, individuals who were more closely related uh, bred with each other and uh, produce these, um, what we call, uh, runs of homozygosity. And those blocks are, are significantly larger in, in southern white rhinos than northern white rhinos. The gene loss is essentially irreversible. Once it's lost, its restoration is slow and is facilita only facilitated by greatly pop larger population size and many generations. And as we can see from the mountain gorillas, selection is not as effective for mildly deleterious genes in small populations. And beneficial mutations can be uh, diminished or lost because of the uh, genetic drift is a larger factor than, uh, is stronger than selection. So the extinction vortex is deterministic, but is it reversible? 
Is it true that once genetic diversity is lost, it can't be regained? Well, um, we know from small populations of, uh, of species that are in decline, it's possible to rescue their fitness by a translocation of individuals um, it back into those populations. That's known as genetic rescue in the Florida panther is a classic example. But could genetic rescue be possible using advanced cellular and genetic techniques, such as artificial insemination, um, cloning, and um, applying stem cell uh, technology with uh, assisted reproduction methodologies? And um, in an evaluation or an exploration of that possibility in collaboration with Revive and Restore, a, a nonprofit conservation biotech organization, and Viagen, Equine, and Pets, the uh, world's biggest uh, commercial cloning company, uh, we produced a uh, Pshavalsky's horse clone um, from cell cultures of an individual uh, that were established in 1980. Uh, that individual is now deceased, but his clone um, uh, has now more gen has is the most genetically valuable stallion for the breeding population of this uh, endangered species. This clone was named Kurt in honor of Kurt Bernerska, the founder of the Frozen Zoo and a founding member of CARTA. This same collaboration has also teamed up to clone the first U.S. endangered species, a black-footed ferret um, named Elizabeth Ann. The cells for cloning Elizabeth Ann were derived from a an individual from the last wild population who was brought into the managed breeding program that saved the species, but she left no living descendants in the current population. So this clone black-footed ferret um, has a, a substantial amount of genetic variation that's lost from the current population. And when she breeds, we hope to be able to evaluate restoring that variation into the wild population. So the collection of living cells in the frozen zoo has many uh, utilities. And uh, we explored uh, a while ago the opportunity to make induced pluripotent stem cells out of these in collaboration with Gene Loring and Inbar Friedrich Ben Nunn at the Scripps Research Institute. This work is being continued by Marisa Carodi at the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, who's produced um, induced pluripotent stem cells from nine northern white rhino individuals. And these graphics uh, depict the um, evidence that these uh, cell cultures are indeed have in markers of pluripotency. So I want to give a shout out to the uh, team that uh, has made this possible, the frozen zoo team that banks the cells and the reproductive sciences team that is banking a semen and the conservation genetics team that banks uh, uh, frozen tissues and uh, undertakes the genomics work with uh, part of Zoonomia and our collaborators. And just uh, sum up by saying, Comparative genomics offers a new tool for extinction risk assessments, and the news is maybe that we need to be more concerned about the loss of genetic diversity um, than we have been, and that cellular-based genetic rescue may be a potential option for mitigating uh, losses of genetic diversity within species and preventing species extinctions, but it will depend on greatly enhanced efforts to bank cells um, because at the present time, approximately 6% of these IUCN threatened category species actually have individuals cryopreserved. Thank you.